All right, so we left off uh, discussing hagfishes um, and how hagfishes do not have uh, jaw per se, they have a mouth. Um, so we're kind of working our way through the evolutionary story of animals and how they evolved and starting with hagfishes and lampreys and now we are going to move on to the evolution of jaw. So I think I showed you some videos about slime, um, the slime that they secrete. So. Okay, so the evolution of the jaw was a significant turning point for animals um, because now they could branch out, they could expand their habitat, they could start to ingest uh, different food, so they actually started to adopt a predatory lifestyle. Jaws are a form of protection. So how did jaws evolve? Uh, they evolved from these structures called um, branchial arches, which are in between the gill openings. So they're kind of like beams that help um, support the gills. And they just think that the ones closest to the, the mouth, the anterior ones, uh, started to evolve into a jaw, a mandible arch, if you will. Some evidence that supports it, you know, jaws are made up of the same material that these branchial arches are made up of. So now that we have a stronger opening here for the jaw, um, we can increase our ventilation, get more oxygen, um, increase our metabolic needs, and again, adopt that predatory lifestyle. So uh, continuing on with the evolution of the jaw, um, two important fish that we got to talk about, the spiny fish and the placoderms. So both of these types of fish had jaws. Um, we'll start with the spiny fish because it's, the jaws are simpler, not as efficient as the placoderms. But the spiny fish did replace the osteoderms um, and then became extinct in the Permian period. So based on the fossils, we know that their skeleton was made of cartilage, that those scales did have small plates of bone. And that they had extra fins. And when you have extra fins, you have a better control of your movements, so you're a better swimmer. Placoderms kind of took over, and their jaws were way better than the spiny fish. On the next slide, I'll show you um, what these two types of fish looked like. 
but the Devonian period, that was the age of the fishes. This is where fishes started to radiate out into the different um, body plans and st structures that we see today. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. So spiny fish, one type of spiny fish is the acanthidean, okay? And they had these spines, but you can see that now we have extra fins to help us move. These are the, placo, uh, the placoderms, and they just had plates uh, over them, so they just kind of look like tanks uh, to me anyways. So um, acanthideans are, are now their own class. You'll see this terminology come up in our lecture again. Um, these guys, they just have a weird pectoral appendage that's way different from the ones from the acanthideans. Um, we start to see jaws with sharp teeth, again, adopting that predatory lifestyle. And now the gills, because of all these plates, um, is below instead of behind the brain case on top. So, yeah. Let's move on. Okay, sharks. So the pioneer vertebrates, that's the spiny fish, the placoderms, um, the ostraderms, uh, they were all replaced um, after several mass extinctions, replaced by the sharks and the bony fish. So sharks and bony fish, again, also appeared in the Devonian, but they really became dominant during the Carboniferous period, named after where plants kind of took off on land. We, we see the jaw um, improve, opening their mouth larger than previous jaws. Sharks belong to a class called chondrichthys. Um, their skeletons is cartilage. And when you dissect your shark later on this year, which in fact, I think they're probably gonna show up tomorrow at school, specimens. Um, in order to get to the brain, you're going to have to chip away at the cartilage. Um, it's really hard to, you can't just cut into it. Um, it's so, it's very thick, so you literally have to chip away. Um, and I remember in my anatomy class in high school, I was working with a girl who like didn't really want to do that at all. She just, you know, I, I was her lab partner. She's like, you can have at it. So I'm like chipping away at this cartilage and this piece went flying and it went down her shirt. <laughs> and she was kind of big. And she's like, oh my God, I have cartilage in my cleavage. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the chondrichthys, it includes not just the sharks, but the skates and rays, okay? Um, but these guys, you'll see that they're streamlined. We'll see paired fins on them. 
They are light because cartilage is lighter than bone. It's very flexible. You'll see that again with the sharks. Um, so it just these characteristics make them superior swimmers as well as very good predators. Now with our improved jaws, um, we're going to talk a little bit about teeth um, and how um, how did teeth evolved from. So sharks, I don't know if has anyone here ever like touched a shark? Maybe they went to an aquarium and they yeah. touched. Do you remember what it felt like? So it was bumpy. It wasn't smooth, right? So it, they actually feel like sandpaper. Okay. So when you when you go one way, it's somewhat smooth, and then when you go the other way, it's like really like oh my gosh, sandpaper. Like ugh. Um, so that is made up of, of scales, and teeth actually evolved from the the scales around the jaws. So these teeth. Um, like I said, evolved from the rough scales. It's not in the jaw like our teeth are. It sits actually on top of it. And because they come from scales, you know, sharks, they lose teeth a lot and they just have rows behind it that can replace it. So they're just constantly growing new teeth to replace the ones that they lose. Another adaptation we see with the chondrichthyes and you know and other fish as well, bony fish, a lateral line system. So series of sensory organs that runs down the entire length of the fish. It kind of detects vibrations. It's equivalent to how they hear. So in between the scales, they have these sensory cells um, and these sensory hair cells kind of, they kind of look like cilia at the base and they'll detect these vibrations and they'll move and then send a nerve impulse um, to the brain. Reproduction for the chondrichthyes, which again, sharks, skates, and rays, uh, is actually really unique uh, for them and for any aquatic species. They are internally fertilized, the eggs of, of the females. So male sharks, they'll have claspers. So again, when you get your shark, you'll try to determine the gender of it. And again, you're, you're looking just for claspers. If it's got a clasper, it's males, okay? It's a male shark. Um, so these claspers, they actually are used to help grasp the female, and then it also helps guide the sperm uh, to get to the female. And so you can see down here, two sharks uh, going at it. Um, and then the eggs develop inside the female, and then they give life, life birth. Um, the gestation period is longer for sharks than other fish, uh, other species of aquatic animals. Um, I, don't, I think your book talks about a section about how the sharks are disappearing because we're overhunting them. And again, the gestation period is long. And um, so it's kind of like sad because they've been around for hundreds of millions of years and, you know, yeah, go us. Right. Oh, shoots. Okay. So teeth. Yes. Right. Could you imagine? But these are nerd glasses, extra information. But um, there are, you know, other fish that have teeth and there's different types of teeth. But this species right here, and I should, I wish I would have put it in the notes what the species is. But I mean, if you look at those teeth, ugh, they look like human teeth. Okay. Anyways, moving on. Bony fish.
Okay, so at the same time that sharks existed, um, we have bony fish that appear. And they kind of took a different evolutionary ro road. In fact, some line of bony fish is going to eventually become the amphibians. Uh, but they adopted a heavy internal skeleton made of bone, and bone is heavier. Um, but because bone is stronger than cartilage, we can have stronger muscles attached to these bones um, and thus increase strength. Again, we'll see a, a, a better improvement on fins. Thin scales, not so thick, symmetrical tails, kind of different from the sharks and basically bony fish, they kind of took over and dominated. Now because bony fish um, have bones and they're heavier, they had to evolve uh, another structure to help them float in the water, and that is the swim bladder. Okay, so sharks, they don't have a swim bladder, and so I'm sure you've, maybe you've heard that they have to keep moving, otherwise they'll just sink um, because their bodies are denser than water, so the, they'll sink. But if they keep moving, then they can control uh, what, ele what level they are at in the water. Um, in the primitive bony fish, the, the bladder was located behind the throat, so that probably has something to do with just them opening their mouth and then being able to um, gulp the air at the surface of the water so as it surfaced and grabbed some and then went back down kind of like a submarine. Um, but today that swim bladder is now an independent organ and you'll see that with the perch um, that you'll dissect um, and it's filled internally. It doesn't have to go to the surface to get the, the nitrogen and the oxygen to fill it. So I'm going to show you a YouTube video here. You may have heard that sharks need to keep swimming in order to stay alive because they need water to be constantly flowing over their gills in order to get enough oxygen to survive. Now whilst this is true for many species of shark, it isn't true for all of them. For instance, some species use a process known as buckle pumping, where mussels pull water in through the mouth and over the gills internally. But there is something else that keeps sharks on the move. If they were to stop swimming, Sharks would actually sink. Now sharks are what are known as cartilaginous fish, 
which means that their skeletons aren't made from bone like ours are, but instead they're made of cartilage, the same stuff that you find all around your body, including in your nose. Now this sets them apart from many other species of fish, which are known as bony fish. Now their skeletons are made up of primarily bone tissue, and it's thought that their evolutionary paths split from each other over 400 million years ago. The bony fish went on to develop organs known as swim bladders, which, by the way, I'm going to be doing an entire episode on because swim bladders are incredible and there is too much to talk about about them to include in this episode. But for now, all you need to know is that swim bladders are gas-filled sacs which give the fish control over their buoyancy and their vertical position in the water by controlling the amount of gas that's actually inside the sacs. And it allows them to achieve something called neutral buoyancy at different depths. A neutral buoyancy is where the density of an object is equal to the density of the fluid that it's immersed in. In this case, the fluid is water. And this is essentially where the upward and the downward forces acting on an object are equal or balanced. So an object that has neutral buoyancy will neither sink nor rise. Now the swim bladders allow these fish to achieve neutral buoyancy, which allows them to stay at their current depth without wasting energy swimming. Now the cartilaginous fish, on the other hand, didn't go on to develop these swim bladders. Now some sharks just take advantage of this and live a bottom-dwelling existence, but other sharks have to work around the problem using a few different methods. Now the first thing that actually comes into play is actually the fact that their skeletons are made of cartilage. A cartilage is actually around half the density of bone, so the complete exclusion of bone from their skeletons means that the shark's overall density is actually reduced. And then there's the shark's massive livers. Now some sharks have livers that even take up 30% of their overall body mass. But importantly, these livers are all packed full of oils. The oils are less dense than water, so they provide the sharks with additional buoyancy. But even with these features, sharks don't have neutral buoyancy. So they have to utilize something called dynamic lift. As they swim through the water, they use their powerful pectoral fins in such a way that they generate lift. And this is actually really similar to how a plane uses its wings to fly through the air. The shape and the angle of the wing causes air that's flowing below it to be deflected down. And through something known as the Coanda effect, it also causes air flowing above it to follow its curve and also be deflected down. Ultimately, this downward deflection of air forces the plane's wing upward. And this is known as lift. And sharks utilize this process. Just instead of wings, they're using fins. And instead of in the air, they're in the water. So essentially, sharks are flying through the oceans. Now the lack of a swim bladder gives them the ability to freely move through different depths of water. Fish that have swim bladders are generally limited to certain depths, and they also run the risk of harmful compression or decompression if they change the depth that they're at too quickly. The ability that sharks have to do this is actually one of the factors that contributes to their success as one of the formidable predators of the marine environment and allows them to have incredible maneuverability. But it does also come with some drawbacks. For instance, it actually means that they can't swim backwards in order to go back, they either have to drift in a current or completely turn themselves around. And even though there are some exceptions to the rule, like the recent discovery that some deep water sharks actually have positive buoyancy forcing them upwards. For the most part, if a shark does stop swimming, it's going to lose its neutral buoyancy and therefore its ability to control and maintain its depth in the water. So soon, it will start to sink down into the deep blue sea. One thing about the uh, the liver of sharks, he was well, he's not lying. It's really oily, and when we do dissect sharks, I mean, like you're gonna need to really wash your hands. It's really gonna, it's yeah, and they're slippery too. So just watch out. Okay, bony fish also have a gill cover, basically a hard plate called the operculum that covers their gills. 
on each side of the head. Wow, not heat. Jeez, head, head. And so they'll flex these gill plates um, and it helps to pump water over the gills. Okay, so they'll close their um, apiculum, open their mouth, water gets drawn in, and then they'll close the mouth and then they'll open it, and then it will be forced to go um, past the gills and then it will extract um, oxygen. So. Okay. All right, final slide with fishes the transition from water to land, sort of, setting us up for it. So that transition from water to land uh, is actually through the coelacanths or the lobed finned fishes. So bony fish can be grouped into two groups, the ray finned fishes and the lobed finned fishes. The ray finned fishes belong to the class um, Actinoturingi. Actinoturingi. Basically, they don't have any muscles in their fins. Uh, the fins look a little spiny, if you will. And then the lobed fin fishes, class Sarcopteryngi, um, also known as the coelacanths, we see bones in the fin and muscles. And the leading hypothesis is that these bones um, will evolve into forelimbs.
Okay. Review questions. In which of the following animal groups did the jaw evolve? Sea fishes. Which of the following is not a key characteristic of fishes? It's no. Oh, they have single loop. Nope. They have a vertebral. They have a. They have a column. All of the jaws. Well, we just talked about jaws. <laughs> we have gills. They have gills. <laughs> All of them. Oh, did you? I thought you said. Oh, I thought you said B. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, it is E. Sorry. So they have a vertebral column. Okay. Jaws. Jaws? Jaws? <laughs> yeah, sorry. My bad. Okay, select the best representative for the class of fish from which amphibians almost certainly evolved from. It's D, the lobed fin fishes, the, the ones with that have muscles and bones in their uh, front fins. And then the blank of the bony fish evolves to counter the effects of increased <laughs> bone density. C. C, swim bladder. All right, moving on to amphibians. And this will be the last section we'll cover today. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the three major groups of amphibians. They include frogs, um, frogs and toads, salamanders, newts, and then uh, these guys right here, I think it, they're called the Sicilians. And then explain the challenges for moving from an aquatic to a terrestrial environment. All right, so there are five distinguishing features of amphibians. First one up is legs. So frogs and salamanders do have legs. Um, the Sicilians lost their legs due to uh, how they how they live. Um, as you saw in the front picture, they kind of look like a snake slash worm. Um, so they lost their limbs to be a little bit more streamlined as they move through the soil. Second distinguishing feature, lungs. Now the lungs of the amphibians, they're not the greatest, okay? But we can work from it and you'll see how in the reptilians and the mammals, uh, how much uh, surface area has increased between those versus the amphibians. But they do possess a pair of lungs. We also see cutaneous respiration, which means they breathe through their skin. And as a result, their skin has to be kept moist so that diffusion can occur. Um, so the skin kind of makes up for the lack of surface area that the lungs provide. Um, so they work hand in hand, basically. Pulmonary veins, blood that is oxygenated from the lungs return through the pulmonary veins to the heart to be repumped. So basically, pump uh, the heart pumps blood that has low oxygen to the lungs. The blood then picks up oxygen, you know, when it's in the lungs, and then it gets pumped back to the heart to get pumped throughout the body. Which kind of ties into the fifth distinguishing feature is a partially divided heart. Uh, does anyone remember how many chambers fish have? Four. Not four. It was two. Okay, Fish only have two chambers, an atria and a ventricle. Here with amphibians, we start to see three chambers. And then when we get to reptiles and mammals, you'll see four. So a partially divided heart, I think if I remember right, it has two atria and a ventricle. Um, so it, it helps to prevent the oxygenated or aerated blood from mixing with blood that has low levels of oxygen. It's not quite perfect, um, but it's getting there. So we start to see two separate pathways for blood, a pulmonary um, circulatory pathway and a systemic pathway. So pulmonary is lungs. It means it goes from heart to lungs, 
lungs back to the heart, and then the systemic is heart to the rest of the body, and then back to the heart. Okay, so let's talk about the challenges that amphibians had to overcome terrestrial life. Kind of similar to like, you know, what plants had to you know, kind of go through, but amphibia means a double life. And that's because they start their life usually in the water and then they transition uh, to land or they're still tied to water in some way. But number one, one challenge they had to overcome was it had to be able to have structures that support its body uh, weight on land. And so legs, four limbs, uh, kind of take care of that. And, and in some species, obviously, um, those limbs are quite powerful. When an organism lives in the water, you know, they have gills. Um, and the buoyancy of water that helps support them, well, now that we're on land, we don't have gills, we have lungs. So lungs kind of take care of that problem. Because we have limbs and muscles, you know, maybe these animals are going to get a bit larger, so we need to make sure that we can deliver enough oxygen for it to perform metabolic activities. So we have um, a little bit a more efficient heart and circulatory system. But again, we're still tied to the water for the reproduction aspect of it. Can't let the eggs dry out. So a lot of times they'll lay the eggs in the water. And if you remember from our cane toad video, just laying a stream of, of eggs and then the male um, releases its sperm and fertilization takes place outside the body. Um, so yeah. And then prevent the body from drying out. Okay, we're feeling a little parched. Let's just go take a little swim and then you know hop back out. Okay, so the first amphibians evolved from the lobed fin fish, and there's two types of fossils that we're going to talk about. The ichthyostega is the earliest fossils. We start to see some sturdy forelimbs supported by shoulder bones to help them propel um, on land. The hind limbs were flippered shaped, which means they were dragged. We also see ribs, and ribs um, protect the heart and lungs, but they give it space for those two types of organs as well. You don't really see um, ribs in fish. And then in 2006, we came across a species um, that is most likely the transitional form, um, kind of like halvesies between a fish and an amphibian called the tetalic. And what makes it unique is that it had features of fish um, as well as features of amphibians. So it had gills and scales like a fish, but its neck, the way it was arranged in the skeletal structure, was more amphibian. It also had four limbs that were similar to amphibians, but then at the very end, we saw that it transitioned or turned into a lobed fin. So they didn't have toes like frogs do. Instead, it was two fins at the end of their forelimb.
Okay, so today's amphibians can be grouped into three different orders. So I'm just going to go through the three orders uh, quickly here. So the first order is the Anora, which is the frogs and the toads. So some basic features with the order Anora, um, no tails. They do live in a variety of environments. There are some that have adapted to desert life, some that adapt, are adapted to mountains, ponds, even puddles, wet. Uh, so you, you see it all. There is a difference between frogs and toads. You know, frogs have a smooth, moist skin, broad body, long hind limbs, excellent jumpers, and obviously are tied to that moist environment. Toads, on the other hand, dry, bumpy, short legs and have adapted themselves to take on the dry environments, kind of like, again, the cane toads of Australia. Eggs are fertilized externally in some body of water, and then they will hatch into tadpoles. Okay, second order, the Kadata, which is the salamanders. Here we see a long tail, elongated bodies, not broad like the frogs or toads, smooth, moist skin. So because of that moist skin and they breathe through their skin, they tend to live in moist places. Still tied to the water with their eggs, um, but they do practice internal fertilization. And the last order is order apoda, because they don't have any uh, feet or limbs. So there's that prefix uh, poda for that, but a means without. And it's the Sicilians. Uh, these guys live in the tropics. They are burrowing amphibians, legless, worm-like creatures. But they do have jaws and teeth, small eyes, and are often blind, because if they live underground, you really don't need them. And again, fertilization is yeah, internal.
guess we'll re do review tomorrow.